Hey there guys, I'm Will and welcome to FP1. Now, as Formula 1 cars get faster and faster, it becomes increasingly difficult to eke out that last little bit of performance on the racetrack. Back in the day, if a team wanted to test a new aerodynamic component, they'd have to build a full-scale piece, then test it on the car. Now, not only was this a very costly process, but without today's benefits of computer-aided design and CFD, it was highly likely for the, you know, these parts to fail and all that hard work to go down the drain. But then came the 1970s and the introduction of wind tunnel testing in Formula 1. Now that dramatically changed the way in which the cars were designed, but how do these devices work and what do they actually do? Well, in today's video, I thought we'd set about answering that question. Now, we're going to break it down into three parts. Firstly, we'll talk about what a wind tunnel is and how they actually work. Uh, then we'll look at the common procedure of a new aerodynamic part on an F1 car, how it would go from the drawing board all the way over to the F1 car on the race day on Sunday. And then finally, we'll start discussing about how all this is going to change when we hit 2021. Also, just before we get into this one, just want to thank you guys so much for 600 subscribers. We passed that this morning, uh, absolutely gassed. Let's keep aiming, let's, let's keep going up. I want to aim for 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So... If we could hit that, that would be incredible. Bit ambitious, but I know we can do it. But yeah, thanks again, guys. Now, let's get straight into these. So there are two ways in which you can see how an object interacts with the air around it. Now, you can strap it onto a car and drive it down a straight road. But if you do that, you're going to run out of road or you'll hit something. The other option, though, is to keep that car static and have the air moving around it rather than it moving through the air. Now, if the car doesn't move, you haven't got to worry about putting an engine in the car or filling it with fuel or even worrying about a driver. But how could you move this large quantity of air of the car? Well, that's where wind tunnels come in. Now, in short, wind tunnels are these large tubes with fans all around them to help push this air into what we call a test area. Now, this might be where you put a car or part of a car, basically whatever you want to observe and test. So there are two main types of wind tunnels, you get open loop and closed loop tunnels. Now, in layman's terms, open loop basically take air from the outside and send it through this test area we spoke about earlier. Closed loop, meanwhile, uh, which is the variant used by the majority, if not all, of the F1 teams, will circulate the same amount of air around one big circle around an oval. Hence, it's closed, it's not, no air's getting in from the outside. Now, in this big loop, you've got several massive sets of fans. Basically, rotate this air around and keep it moving. Now, these closed loop systems, they've got the advantage of, you know, yielding more accurate results, but they do take up a massive amount of space. And this is why some teams in the past used to hire out big wind tunnels so they didn't have to invest in a new building at the factory. Yeah, a really good example, this is the Caterham team up until 2014. Sadly, that wind tunnel produced this monstrosity. Huh. Now, pumping all this air with massive fans at high speeds requires a hell of a lot of power and that's a problem. Thankfully, we can exploit physics and fluid dynamics to at least partially solve this. So if you look at the cross-sectional area of a wind tunnel, what you'll notice is it's a lot narrower, a lot smaller, a lot thinner uh, in the test area when you compare it to the rest of the structure. And this is by accident. You see, this is exploiting a phenomenon known as the Venturi effect. Now, in essence, if you take air in a really large area, then squeeze that through a smaller gap, the air particles start to speed up. Now, there's a lot of fiddly equations behind this, but effectively, the speed of the air as it moves through this gap depends upon the cross-sectional area of what you're moving through, the density of the air, and then the pressure of the air. So if you can keep the density and the pressure the same throughout the entirety of the wind tunnel, then you can basically manipulate the speed of the air by varying the cross-sectional area of the tunnel. <laughs> Still following? Don't worry, that's about as hard as it gets. It won't get worse than that. So why do we use this Venturi effect? Well, it's basically to save power. So if you can speed the air up in this just this test section, you can run the fans at a lower power setting and basically save a lot of energy and therefore save a lot of money. But what can we actually test and how can we even measure things in the wind tunnel? Well, frankly, there's an endless amount of tests you can carry out, but a lot of the common ones involve what we call pressure tappings. Think of these like little holes that are in a part and they're attached to equipment that measures the pressure of the air uh, around that part of the component. Now, creating downforce in the race car, it's all about creating a pressure difference between the top and the bottom of the car, but I'll get into that in a later video, so make sure you're subscribed for that one. Basically, using these pressure tappings, we can look at the pressure at different parts of the car and we can decide if that is making the downforce that we expected it to. Now, a more crude, but I guess cheap and effective way to physically see what the air is doing is to use these little tassels or little pieces of string, and we can attach these to the part that we're testing. Now, while the test is in progress, you'll be able to see what the air is doing by looking at these tassels and the direction that they're blowing. So if you look at this test that I did on a wing uh, back last year, you can see that the tassels are going a bit crazy at the bottom of the part. Now, from there, I can tell that the flow has separated off this wing 
and it's not producing the lift or the downforce as much, well, at least as much as it could anyway. So how does a part go from the drawing board away to the race car? Well, if an engineer comes up with an idea, he's first gonna build it up in computer-aided design, or we call this CAD software. Now, this lets us build a 3D model of the part in question. So for example, here's a really basic rear wing that I produced uh, for a podcast on F1 Fanatics a while back. I'll leave a link to that down in the description below. The next step then is to test this part in CFD, or Computational Fluid Dynamics. Sounds fiddly, but basically what it is, is a virtual wind tunnel, and it's much cheaper to run as a result. This basically lets us test the part without actually having to physically build it and waste the money of building this part if, it, if we don't know if it's going to work or not. And you can see here, sticking with this rear wing I did with F1 Fanatics, this is a very basic example of CFD, so it's nothing like what the F1 teams would use, they would go to a much higher level of detail, and in fact, some teams even have entire buildings filled with supercomputers to do this sort of thing to an insane level of precision. That said though, CFD isn't always accurate, and it's where wind tunnels come in. If a part is showing a potential improvement in CFD, then it will be built and be fitted onto a 40% scale model of the F1 car. Now, why 40%? Well, back in 2009, in order to cut costs, the FIA made some rule changes, basically banning teams from putting their full car in the wind tunnels. It's all to save money. They also limited the amount of runs that F1 teams could do. So the teams instead use a 40% scale model of the car. So if the part is looking good in CFD and then still performs in the wind tunnel, it's likely then to be manufactured full size for the car in a race situation. But it should be noted that these wind tunnels are not always accurate. In fact, in the last couple of years, two cases spring to mind to prove this. McLaren and Williams both had issues back in 2018 with cars that looked amazing in a wind tunnel, but just didn't perform out on track. Williams had a rear wing which kept stalling at high speeds. In other words, it would go from producing loads of downforce to producing absolutely none when the car needed it around a corner. And, well, you can guess how well that's going to go, can't you? McLaren's issue was arguably worse, though, and it was an issue with the wheelbase, which meant that the whole bargeboard section of the car wasn't working anywhere near its peak. And, yeah, the car was still drivable, but you'll remember their 2018 season was pretty awful, and this is the reason why. To make matters worse, an issue like this in the wheelbase is very difficult to fix. It's not just a matter of redesigning just the wheelbase. You've got to redesign the entire car. So in other words, McLaren had to wait until 2019 till they could actually solve this. Right, so finally then, let's talk about what's changing. Well, to begin with, the base number of tests teams that are allowed to do is being cut by 30%. In other words, from 2021, the teams will only be allowed to do 40 runs per week in the wind tunnel. That's actually just a base value. It gets a little bit more complicated than that. This is basically to help teams hit the cost cap without having to cut staff instead. Now, I mentioned it gets more complicated. This is where it does. So depending on where the teams finish in 2020, it's going to depend how much wind tunnel time they actually get. So remember that base value was 40 runs per week. Well, the team that finishes first only get 90% of that. So in other words, 36 runs. Meanwhile, the team that finished last of the Constructors' Championship will get 112% of that initial value, so 45 punt runs per week. Should be noted that any new team, so let's say this Panthera team that keeps getting talked about come onto the grid, they will get that 112% value as well for their first year. Now, from 2022, these percentages get exaggerated yet again. Now, this time the team in first gets only 70% of that base 40 runs, and the team in last gets 115%. Now, the whole aim of this is to reduce the cost, but also to allow those teams lower down the field, say a Haas or a Williams, the opportunity to catch up with the leads a little bit quicker, and thus hopefully slowly bunch up the field as we move through this new set of technical regulations. But I did hope you enjoyed this slightly different type of video, so if you have any other questions about wind tunnels, pop them down in the comments, and I'll try my best to explain them. I hope I've explained that in a way that as many people as possible can understand, but if I have been unclear on anything, please let me know down in the comments and leave some feedback so I can do a few more like these in the future. If you do enjoy me talking technical though, I did do an entire series on the channel back in February talking through the aerodynamic development of the 2020 car, so I'll leave a link to that playlist down in the description below. Uh, but yeah, like I said at the beginning, thanks again for 600 subscribers guys, it's been amazing, you know, eight years on YouTube and we're finally growing, so thank you so much for that, let's keep pushing as we go into the actual F1 season. With all that said and done though, I hope you have a lovely rest of your week and I will see you guys in the next one.